Professor Brian Josephson, guests from the university and guests from outside the university who have come to attend the 15th International Symposium on the Frontiers of Fundamental Physics. In a sense, there is hardly any need to introduce Professor Josephson, who is so well known. He started off as an experimental solid state physicist, and very early on, he discovered the Josephson Junction. So think of Professor Josephson, you think of the Josephson Junction of solid state physics. So after uh, winning the Nobel Prize for this discovery, Professor Josephson also has been working in other fields. For example, he has gone on to communication through the human brain and so on. Very fundamental, very challenging, and very difficult fields. He's uh, working on such fields even today. He will now be talking, and we are eagerly waiting for the talk, uh, on introducing meaning into fundamental physics. Professor Josephson is an emeritus professor of Cambridge University, and we are honored to have him here uh, with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your introduction and also for inviting me to this meeting. It's nice to be invited to a, a meeting where people are for me instead of somewhat hostile to my unorthodox views, um, but won't go into that right now. Um, might just mention my um, history. Uh, I actually started off uh, as a mathematician at Cambridge and I switched to physics and as uh, uh, Germans just said, I uh, started with experimental physics, but then did some theoretical work. Um, then I uh, had a postdoc year in uh, University of Illinois, uh, the invitation of Bardeen. Instead of working on Bard with Bardeen, I worked with Leo Kadanoff on critical phenomena, which um, plays a part in what I'm interested in at the moment. But then I thought um, found physics was a bit boring because um, the major problems in um, many body theory had been solved and there's more in the way of routine stuff so I got interested in the brain and then I moved on to more unorthodox areas um, including paranormal phenomena which um, some people didn't like um, and then I was uh, interested in this problem of fundamental reality, and I, I guess it's taken about 40 years to reach where I am now, which I think is some kind of completion, because um, when you're asked to give a talk at a conference, um, that has some good effects, because uh, one thing you have to uh, make your ideas clear, it's no good waffling about vague ideas uh, in front of an audience, and so I had to um, figure out precisely what the ideas were. And then I found uh, something very interesting that um, I've been studying a lot of uh, uh, non-mainstream -main approaches, people who think that mind and meaning are more fundamental than is accepted in physics. And I found it all started fitting together like pieces in a jigsaw. So it's been quite exciting seeing a whole picture developing, uh, which I'll be talking about now. Okay, so the main point is that uh, physics doesn't um, take meaning into account. So, uh, a theme I've written about quite a bit, uh, you can find a paper, I think, on the archive, uh, Limitations to the Universality of Quantum Mechanics. Um, so, there's problems with conventional physics, which sort of talks about itself in a way that um, where it can't see its limitations. Uh, 
And, um, well, for start, meaning is not considered important, whereas it's now being recognized as being important in biology. So leaving meaning out of account is similar to leaving atoms out of account. And of course, once you take atoms into account, there's a lot more to physics. The thing which is perhaps more relevant is uh, studying crystals without taking lattices into account. Of course, lattices are all important in um, working out how crystals behave. And um, uh, if you didn't recognize the lattice, your physics would be rather, uh, would have things missing. And, and uh, the crystals are one kind of order that one gets in physics, but meaning there's another kind of order which um, uh, is the uh, organized structures in biological systems which um, turn out to depend on meaning in a way that I'll be describing. So that whole business is omitted from conventional physics. And I think it's very important. Uh, and, uh, but also there's a difference between uh, physics and biology. Um, well, I'll, I'll say about how we do take meaning into account. It involves a, uh, a very ancient concept, 19th century, someone called Charles Sanders Peirce um, developed the theory of signs, which I'll be using. But anyway, yeah, so I'll say a little bit about signs. Signs are a bit like information. They are a form of information, but a very special kind. And similarly, cooperation, which you have in biology, parts working together, that's more than mere interaction. Cooperation is a kind of interaction, but a very special kind. So these are the extras that uh, we're talking about. And now I'll, uh, uh, to indicate the difference, I'll quote from uh, uh, Jasper Hoffmeyer, who's done a lot of the work in this field. Um, their signs serve to mediate between information as a whole and the needs of the organism. So out of all the vast amount of information surrounding uh, an organism, some things are important. That, that, that's the information that needs to be taken into account for an organism to achieve its goals and to survive. So that's a way of uh, defining what a sign consists of. Um, and he says this is exactly what distinguishes living from non-living uh, systems, uh, the presence of um, what we were coming to, semiotic in interaction mechanisms, which have no counterpart in non-living systems. So there's something special which biology ignores. Uh, it just illustrative examples, swimming bacteria need to find food, so they take into account, um, they measure uh, food and surroundings, and also how that changes as a they swim. So that's the data that's important for bacteria and uh, they have evolved elaborate systems to take that kind of information into account. A uh, much more subtle kind of uh, information or science system is out of human language and obviously uh, we uh, uh, language is important to us. We have systems which develop language in which interpret it and uh, these result in our goals being achieved. So that's another illustration of the concept of sign. And uh, I'll be explaining in a moment that, uh, well, later on, that this is a, uh, again using um, Hofmeyer's terminology, a kind of scaffolding upon which vast amounts of uh, information, vast amounts of human activity uh, is all dependent upon this structure, uh, the language that you use. Uh, it's, uh, he calls it the semiosphere, which is the realm of meaning that depends on language. Uh, now, just going back to the problems with physics before I move on to semiosis. Um, well, uh, as Freeman Dyson, I think, pointed out the great differences between practices in physics and in biology. Uh, physics likes to deal with nice regularities that you can describe with a formula, but Bi biology doesn't. It's uh, much more complicated. 
also it deals with processes which are less fundamental in physics. In fact, uh, quantum mechanics is based on state as fundamental, whereas in biology processes are equally fundamental. Processes and organization, like catalysis, they're more important in biology than precise numbers. So that is something that's complementary in biology. Uh, so physics really uh, likes to have things that can be quantified, but in biology that's less important. Um, and I think that's led uh, physics in wrong directions. Um, it was fine in the days of Newton and Maxwell equations, but when it came to a quantum world, it led to a picture where if you wanted to get numbers out, you had to deal with statistics. And of course, with statistics, you lose your focus on the individual. And I'm going to say in, uh, that the individual is important, and some people like Karen Bauard have asked how can we um, change our concept of physics so that it deals with the individual case. Um, and another point which was ma made by Neil Spohr, uh, <clears throat> in quantum mechanics you have the idea that certain observations can be complementary, like you can't simultaneously know position and momentum of a particle, Bohr suggested there might be similar complementarity between physics and biology. Um, in a, if you did physical measurements, you would um, destroy the biological information, as you might imagine might happen in a high energy experiment. Well, someone called Delbruck said that's nonsense for quantum uh, effects are unimportant in biology. Well, now we know quantum effects are important in biology, so Bohr was right. So, uh, again, we have the theme that uh, you miss things out if you only look at the kind of information that quantum physics deals with. Okay, well, now uh, I'm going to move on to the basic picture, um, which is, um, actually, we can go back to in, in the 1970s, I did a paper, uh, I think that's now in the archive, uh, the, called the Psychobiological Picture of Physical Reality of um, Michael Conrad, Dupanka Home and myself, um, which noticed that there, a number of things were rather similar between um, quantum physics and biology, um, like observation plays a part. Um, so we concluded that there must be some deeper level which uh, gives rise to quantum phenomena under certain conditions where measurement is important and biology under other conditions. Um, meaning anyway, biology is more fundamental. So the way I put it now is that um, uh, biology continues beyond the kind of life that we're familiar with uh, based on chemistry. Biology is equally important at deeper levels and um, this world beyond quantum mechanics, the indefinite of quantum mechanics is something biological which one can say something about in biological terms. Uh, and uh, in biology, component systems are falling into place just to say atoms in a crystal fall into place and that's what, go what is going on at this fundamental level. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this slide shows the various pieces that I've uh, been assembling to produce this unified picture. So I'm going to go quickly through the various parts. Um, I mentioned uh, Peirce's work in the 19th century, his theory of science, semiotics, which is thought just to apply mainly to um, human use of signs like language, like what kind of um, information do we deal with. And then uh, in the latter half of the 20th century, some biologists took it up and hence was founded uh, biosemiotics. And probably m most biologists haven't heard of biosemiotics and physicists have heard of neither. But anyway, um, that is uh, uh, developing and, and has some crucial concepts, and I'll just indicate two of them, the relationship between structure and process, 
And so a lot of this has parallels with the first lecture this morning, uh, which was got from a, a different standpoint, neural networks, whereas um, the theme in this lecture is that these ideas are more, uh, more widespread, more general. And I mentioned previously scaffolding and semisphere. These are things which fit together in ways that they're coming to in a moment. Then there's the physics side. Um, one of my collaborators is Alex Hankey, who's worked uh, on critical phenomena, but also what he's called complexity biology. So the kind of things we've been discussing. He has the idea of locus of control, uh, linking it with um, instabilities, edge of chaos, and also gestalts, which are fundamental regular forms, which are important in um, mind. Uh, another input is Karen Barrard, who's, um, I mentioned her, she's developed, uh, um, taken Bohr's, I, Bohr's philosophy as a starting point, but, but said we can talk about what's going on. Uh, Bohr talked about what can we, we be talked about, what can be talked about, and Barrard said, well, we can go beyond that, and she's developed a theory called um, a gentle realism, which is fits quite well with biology, um, uh, that you have agencies which work together to produce phenomena, and she's um, shown how you can uh, fit various aspects of quantum phenomena into such a picture. Uh, and then Ruth Kastner is another person who's developed what some of you may have heard of, the transitional, uh, sorry, the transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics which is that you can understand some features of quantum mechanics by saying that two systems talk to each other and come to decisions in that way. But uh, her version emphasizes on the fact that the things that are important are real possibilities, and these transactions lead to particular possibilities being selected. So you see these are all coming together. Finally, uh, sort of um, a rather mysterious contribution. Someone called Alexa Yardley wrote to me about 10 years ago with some rather strange sounding ideas and but gradually I've been realizing that you can understand them from the standpoint I've been talking about. So let me say uh, one of our key ideas is oppos oppositional dynamics which are things that can work together, two things together to form a unit and uh, circles that something circling generate other properties. Uh, this, I think, may be important for developing the future in a more mathematical form. And also the role of triads. I'll be going into this in more detail later. So there's quite a number of things which all fit together to form a unified picture. Uh, and uh, Ballard, I'll just mention, um, I mentioned a moment ago that her picture involves agencies that cooperate through intra actions to produce manifest phenomena. And this is a special interaction which you have when your two agencies or um, operating systems are part of a phenomenon. So this is a part of a terminology. Um, working together, well, or cooperating, you might say. Uh, and uh, she takes up Bohr's idea of apparatus. Apparatus is what's involved in making an observation, and there's a connection between apparatus and the idea that you're trying to produce as definite. So in this picture, you have apparatus which makes what was formerly indefinite more definite, but you have to choose what you want to make definite by choosing the apparatus that works with it. Uh, so one example would be collapse of a wave function. But she, she points out there are stranger things. One thing that uh, some of you may be aware of, uh, which is that you have a, a piece of apparatus, and this is a, a real experiment you can do, a piece of apparatus which looks to see which of two slits a photon went through. And registering that um, gets rid of the interference pattern. But surprisingly enough, you can do an experiment which gets rid of that information, and the interference pattern comes back again. Well, these strange things, uh, she um, uh, 
So it indicates that matter can, is not just matter, it's matter and meaning are entangled and uh, shapes reality in precise waves, just as with life. And uh, rather intriguing comments. Uh, I don't know if it's her own, I think it, she's quoting other people in an interview, but she says, matter feels, converses, suffers, desires, yearns and remembers. Well, anyway, her, her picture, which is described in her book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, uh, is all about what matter is doing and uh, uh, arguing that it's similar to what um, human beings do. Well, that's somewhat speculative and I won't, won't be taking this as my starting point, but something much more concrete, which is what is done in biology in terms of science. But I thought I'd just mention it at this stage. Anyway, so now let's get on to uh, the role of sign theory in biology. And uh, the first point is that when it involves paired systems, that's to say two systems which influence each other and settle down in some kind of form. And this now fits in with the idea of limit cycles, because if two systems, system A influences system B and system B influences system A, then you've got a sort of um, uh, circular process, a feedback, and that uh, cycle uh, may settle down to a, a, a limit cycle, something we're familiar with. And that's something that seems to manifest in a few ways in biosemiotics, uh, like shines correspond to objects, systems to processes, and scaffolding to semiosphere. Well, let's look at the second of these first. Um, I'll, uh, well, the first paragraph is just repeating the quote earlier, what signs do. The point is, the sign is a part of a process, and um, I think we have system and process work together. A biological system is responsible for a biological process, but the process feeds back uh, on the system because from feedback as to how well your system is going, you then adjust the system and eventually you reach some kind of equilibrium where system and process fit together, the process works well. Um, for example, a language, you have a language system and, and people use language in efficient ways, so these are reciprocal. Um, but uh, but in fact, you have stepping stones. The, you have a, uh, an equilibrium, but then it becomes unstable and you find a new equilibrium later on. But anyway, this is a reciprocal process. And, um, uh, and the, a given system uses signs. So signs are, are, were the elementary parts of systems. Your system is a structure built out of, out of sign use, and signs have the property that they refer to objects, they are related to objects. Uh, a sign is something that can be interpreted, and as a result of interpretation, some object is uh, gained as a result. Like, um, say, salt is a sign, and when somebody says pass for salt, you connect that with the actual salt. Uh, so the listener inter interprets the sign as something to do with the salt, and so that process works. But then the uh, speaker, he, he sees the, the salt that he wants, and so he, he produces the sign that corresponds. So there's this mutual uh, correspondence, and links are first tenuous, and then they develop if you keep on with the process. Okay, and, uh, but then the process involves signs going together. Um, well, this just shows the feedback loop. Uh, okay, we start off with some entity, that might be a sign, then some process uh, comes up as a result of it, and the way this develops is you feed back to the original entity so you get this cycle which can develop, and as I show that this again, you missed it the first time, the entity is responsible to a process, and that gets you back to the entity. So one of the points that 
Hanke, is in Hanke's complexity biology approach is uh, g equals 1 or g equals i. You have a feedback loop whose gain is precisely 1, and that means the cycle repeats exactly. So that, he thinks, is an important part of how these things develop. Uh, another idea from semi uh, semiotics is out of code duality. This is the idea that uh, for a system to develop, it's desirable if it has two components. One component which is, say, fixed over time, uh, like the sign that you use, but then a, a variable component. And a variable component, because it can vary, allows for adaptation. So you naturally um, will tend to develop these two components of a cycle. Uh, and uh, again, this sits with the edge of chaos, which was actually mentioned in uh, Dr. Morrow's lecture this morning. Uh, you, he talked about a particular system, the nervous neural nets, which um, show these behavior of being near the edge of chaos. And that means that they fluctuate between sta things being stable and things being unstable. And uh, it's a definition of edge of chaos from Wikipedia. A transition space between order and disorder, a region of bounded instability that engenders a constant dynamic interplay between order and disorder. So this is all part of what goes on. This is the physicist side of it, but it has this biological side that it fits in with the development of signs and signs systems. Uh, okay, now, uh, proceeding further from this, there's the idea that a community may share the use of signs, which involves mechanisms for transmitting signs from one individual to another. And then you have a far more extensive situation. It's not just the individual doing things, but the community does things. And so, uh, and the protocol used is as important as the objects. Uh, for example, the World Wide Web involves a protocol by which um, web servers and web browsers can communicate. Internet protocol involves the ability to do things on the internet and holds everything together. So protocols evolve uh, in order for systems to work together. And um, in this way, once these systems can uh, start off, they can develop into a whole uh, world of shared meaning, the semiosphere. And uh, you can talk about scaffolding, which is really just an extension of the word system. And uh, Hofmeyer has a paper on the web, Semiotic Scaffolding, which explains all of this, and also a book on uh, semiotics. Uh, so there's another, another of these two-way links. I'll just mention another idea. Uh, Terence Deacon uh, de developed the idea of um, mankind being the semiotics, the, sorry, the symbolic species. And here's another concept to throw in. Uh, let me just say, uh, as I sort of mentioned earlier, if you have a, an idea of a structure, um, uh, okay, let, let me go back to the idea of, uh, we start uh, with physics, then you have ideas like these, like the idea of crystal structure. And what this does, once these ideas sort of extend one's knowledge by allowing you to create models. So once you have the idea that crystals have this periodic lattice, you can then make models. So in the same way, uh, these semiotic pictures will allow you to make more precise models. So in other words, they add to the science. So all these things are adding to the science, and it's a different kind of model. And one idea here, which is what um, Peirce introduced when he analyzed signs, is that there are three kinds of signs. The iconic, which means the sign is looks like the thing that it represents. Index is just a labeling system. These two just refer to 
things uh, in the immediate uh, surroundings. But a third kind is the symbolic use of signs. And uh, symbols are different from the other two because they're used to talk about systems that are absent. So they uh, that are not present. So this is what uh, deep thinking involves. If, if we only had, and animals only have these iconic and indexal uses of signs, and they can't sort of think about things in the abstract. Whereas uh, human beings have developed symbol systems, and that allows you to build a, a, a whole new semiosphere, like mathematics, science, and um, logic, and so on, or, or planning involves symbolizing. You, uh, for example, the idea of a restaurant as somewhere where you can eat, uh, so you can therefore use uh, bits of knowledge involving restaurants to decide where to eat. So there's a whole new dimension of um, semiotics using the idea of symbols. So uh, that is another piece of whole picture. So the point I'm getting at is that there's this whole set of knowledge which hasn't really been used by physics and which the biosemioticians have been developing to understand biological systems. For example, you can uh, use them to explain some features of uh, evolution that uh, a totally different new species may come about because a new kind of sign uh, has been introduced into the design, or at least a new use, a new, new use of information, and then evolution can proceed on that basis, on that uh, processes based on that kind of sign. Uh, well, now uh, I want to move towards mathematics because the people working in biosemiotics, as far as I know, haven't used mathematics very much. So the question is, how can we go from this descriptive approach to a ma more mathematical approach? Uh, well, in the paper I'll be mentioning in a moment, uh, we took table tennis to uh, as a, a picture which everyone understands to explain development in steps. Now, in this situation, it is, uh, I've decided driving a car provides a good illustration of how you can mathematize these ideas. If you think about it, there's something rather amazing. Driving a car involves only setting the values of three parameters. In fact, most of the time, only one parameter is involved in driving a car, namely the position of the steering wheel. So that one variable is controlling what the car does. But sometimes you have to brake and accelerate, so that three parameters anyway. So all of driving a car is um, involves just learning how to set these three parameters. Uh, one point, incidentally, is that this is uh, the theory is complicated because these parameters are just telling you the instantaneous dynamics of the car. Uh, your steering wheel is determining the curvature of your trajectory of a car, for example. But for a maneuver like overtaking, you have to add up a performance over a period. You're iterating these short steps, and that makes things quite complicated. Uh, in uh, or, uh, classical dynamics, you're dealing with the um, solution of differential equations. Uh, in quantum mechanics, you have the Hamiltonian and is the exponential of Hamiltonian. So this is just to point out that the theory can get quite complicated. Um, but anyway, uh, so for a given problem like overtaking, what you're doing in learning to overtake is learning what value of a function f to use. f, uh, which depends on the, re the various q's, the relevant variables. That function f is a solution to the problem because you want the iteration over time to avoid colliding or anything like that. And only very special f's will do. So you, you gradually, by uh, uh, learning more and more complicated situations, you develop your function f. So this is showing that this is really a, a mathematical problem, which you could um, uh, try implementing by a computer program. Uh, now, uh, back in 1995, I had a student who was working on kind of mathematics 
not biosemiotics, but a theory of a mathematician called Neil Niels Bass, who introduced uh, the idea of hyperstructures. That was the idea that you um, you can describe development by saying that you have starting structures and you want to figure out what interactions to use between them. So basically, this is the uh, formulation that was used by the student. Uh, it basically means that you try uh, various uh, compound structures from simple structures. You observe what happens and then you adjust the results. I think OBS is the, uh, symbolizes what you get by observing and R uh, is your adjustment. And uh, that treatise is on the uh, Phil Prince or Phil Archive Net, also Cog Prince. Um, so if you go to philarchive.org and search for Osborne, you should find that thesis. And um, here's the program that was based on that idea, and here's the results of that program. These show how the system evolves with time. And I'll just show and enlarge the final scheme. Uh, oh yes, he chose as a, as a simple problem for the system to uh, learn, the problem of balance in one dimension. And this shows how, uh, I guess this, uh, not exactly sure what it was, but it, it's en ending up at the top. Okay. Uh, right, well this, uh, okay, here's where it's achieved a state of balance. Um, but this is actually the second program because uh, what the uh, research project was supposed to demonstrate was going from one step to the next, and this did get to the second step. The first step is it started to balance but then fell over. So then the algorithm was applied to what it learnt in the first stage, and then it, uh, uh, it then developed a thing which could balance permanently. Well, the hope was this would then go on to um, uh, do great things. Uh, the, um, uh, was eventually hoped that it would simulate learning to walk. But then, rather weirdly, the department intervened and they said, this is not physics or something, they, and uh, you can't go on with this. Uh, it's, um, I, uh, I was invited to write this up, well, to write something for the 50th anniversary of the effect, and they said I could include this, and if you look at the, uh, this paper on the archive, entitled Coupled Superconductors and Beyond, you'll find out my uh, battles with the department. So that's unfortunately what seemed to be a promising uh, project, uh, didn't go on any further. So there we are, anyway, let's uh, move on. Uh, stepping stones, we'll step on beyond. So now, another theoretical concept is the idea of stepping stones. Uh, this is mentioned in the, uh, I think the article by Hofmeier. Uh, now we're going back to something earlier on. The, um, the idea that you learn in stages and I mentioned in connection with language that you reach some state where your skill is settled, and then you move on to the next uh, stage. You, you experiment, and it settles again. So this is Hofmeier talks about um, uh, new emergent processes function like stepping stones in the river, leading evolutionary processes forward one step at a time, and on average, farther away from a bank at each step. Uh, so this illustrates the process, now I hope my light will work this time, yes, so you're at this stage, then you start looking at new possibilities and you uh, develop to stage one, uh, then you get to a more chaotic state, reach F3, and so on. Uh, and uh, as it happens back in 76, I wrote a paper in conjunction with Hermann Hauser, person who after he left the Cavendish went on to set up Acorn Computers uh, who um, produced the um, BBC microcomputer and the ARM who probably responsible for the 
chip in your mobile phone. But anyway, we thought about Piaget's uh, articles, uh, his theories of development, and wrote this thing, analysis. Uh, skills are developed not by a single uniform process, but a series of stages, and uh, uh, show how the aims in each learning each stage are qualitatively different, use different cues. So that was um, uh, a, a theoretical um, discussion of the concept of stepping stones. And that's in the Cogprints archive. Uh, uh, but that only works if you look for the right things. If you look for wrong things, it won't work because uh, you just won't get anywhere. You've got to be focused on the right cues. So again, this is the importance of relevant signs. Uh, now, language illustrates this process of steps. Well, I think I've already mentioned this, that you, language develops in steps. People, uh, the key aim of language, or one of the key aims is to communicate. So all the time you're trying to communicate and sometimes it works smoothly, other times it doesn't and you have to experiment and then you develop a new aspect of language so there we go this all, all this illustrates that these abstract ideas have applications to real systems uh, and uh, one point this shows why ordinary physics won't work um, so well because uh, you develop the current state of a process like language is very history dependent. It all depends on what steps were taken in the past, and that's very irregular. So you, this isn't, there isn't going to be a nice, tidy formula for given language. Uh, now, you might say, well, this has nothing to do with physics. Um, uh, okay, uh, these ideas may be nice, but they're nothing to do with physics. However, the position I believe to be the case is that these processes uh, are equally important at fundamental level and they're the, what lies, underlies the, the conventional physics. Uh, so let me quote now uh, various things from Yardley. One idea in the beginning is um, an entity is always part of a, a process, process always part of a system, which is always part of an entity, process and system ad infinitum. If you forget about the ad infinitum, then it's very much like what I've been talking about, processes and systems that form a single entity, but the ad infinitum is something extra. And basically, I think it's saying that you, you have this happening at all scales. So that's um, a simple idea, but it takes you beyond uh, current thinking. And yet, it's not beyond current thinking, because uh, the idea of scale invariance is already present in physics. Uh, in field theory, there's the idea that there's a limit where things become scale invariant, independent of scales. And again, at critical points, uh, you have scale invariance. Uh, uh, so it isn't anything new. And so it wouldn't be at all revolutionary to say, well, these biological processes happen at all scales. And um, that's not unreasonable. Okay, as I said, um, a key idea in Yardley's uh, uh, formulation, a book, so Circular Theory, is that you have two entities which fit together, and we've had examples of these, sign and object, etc. But she applies it in a much more general scale, uh, in a much more general arena. For example, mind and matter are two things that fit together. Mind is one kind of development which is opposed and works with matter. But that's sort of not, not as visible as matter, but it's behind the scenes um, setting up matter, just as uh, systems give rise to processes. So uh, Yardley has a lot of nice ideas which seem to fit with an extension of ordinary um, physics. And uh, some of them make sense quite easily. Others are more obscure, but I think will be important. Uh, for example, reproduction might involve two systems, X and Y, 
um, process X uh, finds Y to join in with it, and then another X joins in with that. Well, of course, we know about that. Uh, we're two strands of DNA, but this might be something more like um, uh, a plant and a seed. Plant goes to seed, and seeds go to plant. So you might, the idea is you start off with something very simple, which becomes more and more elaborate, uh, evolves, and then we get to what we have now. Uh, it's entirely descriptive, but I believe has, can be developed scientifically. Uh, and, uh, but something which is in, beyond that, the triad, the groups of three are supposed to emerge and become important. Uh, and one form of it would be to say, um, you have a combination X, Y, which compare with two separate things. Now I found a nice picture to illustrate this. On the left hand side, you have a single entity uh, showing uh, rocks and a car. These symbolize uh, a rock and a car. Um, the, the real thing, the two separate objects are symbolized by a single thing. So this shows that um, the way that a, a third object can symbolize relationships between two. And uh, a point I didn't mention is that signs are, uh, that the objects of signs referred to can perfectly well be relationships, like above is a sign that refers to a relationship. Okay. Uh, and uh, another interesting thing is that um, uh, in relation to mind and matter, you have an idea which links with a counter idea. These two things are pairs. And he says an idea is connected to a counter idea, or else the idea cannot exist. Well, it's more or less that you don't ass assemble components into an idea unless the idea works with something. So this is a restriction on how parts fit together to form ideas and defines a valid idea. And uh, uh, again, a context, uh, ideas work only in a context, so there may be a symbol relating to an idea which um, links the two in a contextual manner. So these triads are important as regards the mechanics. And she has the term pi, which produces stability and reliability for reality, which in on itself is markedly unstable and unreliable. And that obviously connects with edge of chaos, with one part being a part which uh, reduces chaos. Uh, and uh, one can extend this and talk about global scaffolding, which will be something relating to everything. Uh, so maybe a whole field of mind rather than restricted fields of mind with specific semi-spheres. So, I mean, a global field of mind which could be the origin of everything. And first two are maybe not so controversial since people think about origins of life and origins of the cosmos. But the idea here would be this deeper level uh, develops into in complicated ways. And the direction of evolution is a controversial thing. And uh, another quote from a book as a symbolic a symbolic man in mind, which is the idea of man, which had to be present somewhere hidden before man could appear. So what she seems to be saying there is that there is an idea as to what man consists of. That idea pre-existed and was a factor in determining why man came into existence. And so that's obviously a, something that would support intelligent design, uh, but on a perfectly rational basis where ideas unfold, uh, ideas form and then unfold. Uh, and, um, well, I, I guess since I'm probably running out of time, uh, let's quickly say that this biology extending to all levels is consistent with Bauer's idea that uh, mind links with quantum physics. Uh, you might say that when you, you might make more detailed connection like quantum mechanics enables the linear aspect that observers involve a non-linear apparatus, uh, non-linear things building up structure through apparatus. And Barad talks about observation being cutting a system into two parts, one of which registers the state of the other. So I think we could um, develop um, 
uh, eventually develop connections with standard physics. Now, I've introduced this. I wouldn't have, but somebody, I've had two pleas from people involved in homeopathy saying homeopathy is under threat. You have homeopathy is under serious uh, criticism from people who insist that it's nonsense, uh, uh, rather selective. I, I, one thing I say, one of my aphorisms is, memory of water is easily disproved by any one of a number of easily understood invalid ideas that uh, when people try and disprove it, they are invalid. And that's um, all I have to say about uh, my own position on homeopathy. I've not studied it. I have, to a small part, been involved with Ben Renist's experiments. I even uh, kept the readings in a pocket encoded form when Ben Venice was giving a, a very small scale demonstration. Uh, anyway, Ben Venice had the idea of a biological signal and this is discussed in this paper by one of his colleagues, Jolene Thomas, uh, physical nature of a biological signal. And that would fit in uh, because we know in biology, uh, signals are used to denote particular concepts like animal cries or even human sounds like the sounds of a baby. So signs, particular kinds of sound and waveforms seem to have a, a role in biology. So all you're assuming, if you want an explanation for um, homeopathy, is that uh, these uh, signs can manifest in water and biological, biologically active molecules can generate these signals. And now when you dilute, you get rid of the molecules, no molecules left, but the signals may, under favorable, favorable conditions, still be there. So that's all I want uh, to say in view of um, since, uh, in fact, when I get back, I have to write to um, the court of California uh, because some people are trying to get homeopathy suppressed in California. So I'm going to, uh, as requested, I'm going to make some comments used in that case. Okay, so to conclude, um, so I've said physics has been driven by a particular view, uh, say materialism, that you don't want to include mind as something important. Uh, I think this alternative is much more appealing where you take into account ideas from bi biosemiotics. That took a concept of sign and people have uh, applied it to biology and a uh, whole set of new concepts um, uh, give structure which wasn't there before in biology. And I've argued in principle we can formulate them mathematically and uh, uh, there have been some projects, well a particular project which uh, showed that this kind of idea can work. Uh, so I think in, in future uh, this can be developed mathematically and support the idea that fundamental physics takes these biological ideas to all scales. Uh, acknowledgements, uh, particularly Alexa Yardley uh, bringing uh, circular theory to my attention and some physics discussion with Alex Hanke. Now a very brief comments on the department who suppressed this research. So that's in the past and after 20 years later, uh, maybe thanks to the internet and so on, I've been able to develop these ideas. So I'll conclude there with a biological uh, picture taken from our house. So stop there. Thank you very much.